Hello, my name is Austin Booth. My name is Daniel Shikan, and we are team four representing the University of Mustang. We will begin by sharing our clients' interests, goals, and our strategies used to achieve those goals. The university is interested in moving the soccer team forward in a positive, stable direction that still continues to build on the decades long winning record that they currently have. And this is important to the university because they recognize that continued association with Coach Williams and Dr. Robbins um, and the staff that he worked with could have a negative impact on the university and the athletics program overall. The university is also interested in addressing and minimizing all financial limitations that the university is currently dealing with due to the situation caused by Dr. Robinson, settlements with victims, and COVID-19. The university recognizes that coaches do need to be compensated, but they must make sure that they do so in a way that makes financial sense for the university. And at this point, the soccer team is not producing revenue. Our client's interests influence our goals during this negotiation, which are to reach an agreement to hire Coach Diaz that allows the university to break from all coaches that served under Coach Williams, and to do so while meeting the financial obligations and needs of the university. Our other goal is to establish a compensation structure with the appropriate monetary value and contract conditions, such as buyout clauses and liquidated damages, that allows the university to maintain its financial sustainability given the recent challenges the university has faced. Based on these goals, we have defined our critical issue as follows. The critical issue today is to sign an employment agreement with Coach Diaz so long as she is willing to work within the financial parameters of the university. In order to achieve this goal of hiring Coach Diaz as the head soccer coach, we need to discuss the length of a contract, salary, and specific contract terms. We will begin the conversation by asking Diaz why she's interested in coaching for the Mustangs and what she thinks she can bring to the program. We will ask questions to understand where Diaz's motivations truly lie. And once we better understand why Diaz is interested in coming to the program, we will acknowledge her talent and let her know that she is a top candidate for the coaching position. But the program due to COVID-19, Dr. Richardson and settlements will be go undergoing some um, restructuring. We will share that with Diaz that the university feels that Coach Williams was overcompensated, especially because despite having a successful coaching season, he did not oversee a profitable soccer team. And once this information has been shared with Diaz, we will ask her what her salary expectations are. Once we understand what Diaz is looking for from the university and where her motivations lie, we will begin exploring compensation structures. We will start by presenting a first offer. Although we do have flexibility in structuring offer packages, this offer will not include any extra conditions such as buyout clauses or liquidated damages clauses. As we want to present a lower and simpler initial offer to really better understand what is important to Diaz in terms of short and long-term goals. We will use this information to adjust our offer and compensation package as we move through the negotiation to include any additional contract terms, such as those liquidated damages and buyout clauses, should they be necessary to protect our client's best interests. With that, we are Austin Booth and Daniel Sheehan representing Mustang University. We thank you for your time today, judges. Hello, my name is Francis. And my name is Jonathan. And today we are representing Ms. JC Diaz. First and foremost, we appreciate the judges for judging today's competition and helping us to further develop our negotiating skills, especially in this championship round. Thank you. Making the final round of this competition, it's an absolute honor. And during the short time we had to prepare for this round, my partner and I quickly realized this is a dream position for our client. She is a highly decorated soccer player to say the least, considering she is a two-time Olympic gold medalist and won the 2015 Women's World Cup for Team USA. But we all start somewhere. And Coach Diaz started at the University of Mustang. And in representing Coach Diaz today, it's our job to come to an agreement that meets the interests of both sides and allows Coach Diaz to return to her alma mater. Our client is excited about the possibility of coaching the Mustangs, though she also understands that coaching this team will no, be no easy task. Though our client believes she can salvage parts of the program, the entire culture must essentially be rebuilt from the ground up especially considering all the school's top talent is transferring to different schools. 
amid the scandal during the Williams administration. I mean, Williams, <laughs> Williams uh, coaching. Not only would Diaz hire, hire be a breath of fresh air following the recent events, more importantly, her U.S. national team affiliation will be a big attraction for current and future college athletes, especially considering that the U.S. women's national team is an extraordinary honor, as they are, without a shadow of a doubt, the best women's soccer team in the world. And they've been this like this for decades. To answer the first question on what are your client's main interests and goals for the negotiation, we understand there are four main interests and goals. The first one is related to contract length. Coach Diaz wants to build back this program and restore its name. And she believes an eight-year deal at least would go a long way in her putting this program back on the right track. Second, ensuring Coach Diaz can get the proper coaching staff to set a team culture is also very important. So with this in mind, Coach Diaz wants the university to commit to maintaining its current assistant coaching budget of $250,000 per year, but at a minimum, she wants to keep the budget at $200,000. Third, we want to ensure Coach Diaz receives her proper value in the salary. Agreeing to a contract that pays on average $200,000 a year, or at very least $1.6 million over the length of the contract. But to show flexibility, we are willing to accept a starting salary that is a bit lower as long as that substantially increases over time. Lastly, we want to discuss the overall commitment by the school. Ideally, the contract would not have a buyout clause, so the school would have to pay her salary in full unless she's fired for a cause. But if absolutely necessary, we can sh show flexibility and agree to a buyout clause as, I, as long as 50% of, uh, of the salary is guaranteed for years five through eight, and that the salary for years one through four is 100% guaranteed. And to move on to our second question on what is your overall negotiation strategy and why, our overall negotiation strategy is a collaborative problem-solving strategy to reach a mutually beneficial agreement for both sides. We believe this strategy will be very vital today in really understanding the opponent's positions. And within the strategy, we'll use several tactics, such as asking probative, open-ended questions in conjunction with our active listening skills to really data mine our opponents today. We plan on starting the conversation by asking what culture the university hopes to cultivate in light of the recent controversy. We know the school is trying to move on from the era of Coach Williams and Dr. Robinson. However, we believe that by asking this probative open-ended question, we'll be able to elicit this information from our opponent and use that information to help us reach our goals today. Another tactic we feel will be beneficial is a tactic we like to call psychological word choice which is just a cognizant selection of certain words or phrases to subtly influence our opponents or to shape the tone and atmosphere of the conversation. Excuse me. We believe it will be extremely important to emphasize our client's accomplishments and why she would be ideal for the job. First and foremost, she won a championship with the Mustang Buckaroos in 2006, and she, was, she holds an extremely great record as a coach with 100 wins, 18 ties, and only four losses. And of course, we wanna highlight the significance of her experience with the women's national team and her continued position as a coaching assistant for the U.S. national, national team. However, we do know this, this negotiation will be very fluid and dynamic, so we're prepared to use other tactics, such as an integrative use of isolation, positive deflection, and of course, the also famous pregnant pause. We believe that by using this strategy we mentioned here will really be instrumental in helping us achieve our goals and interests we laid out before. Thank you very much. All right, hello. How are y'all doing today? My name is Francis. Hi, Hi Francis. Francis. My name is Daniel Sheehan. My name is Austin Booth. We represent the University of Mustang. Hello, Daniel and Austin to you both. My name is Jonathan. We're very happy to be here speaking with you both. Before we do dive into the nitty gritty of the conversation, we did want to share something that Francis and I are planning on doing for today's discussion. We do understand Zoom presents certain challenges that weren't really present before the virus hit. So in order to make this conversation the most fruitful and productive, we're proposing that we all try our best not to talk over one another. That way we all understand what's being communicated. Yeah, absolutely, Jonathan, we completely agree. Wonderful, and we, we do have an agenda that we want to lay out today, but just really briefly, we do wanna treat this negotiation akin to a settlement conference where everything we discuss between the two parties in the event that we don't come to an agreement today remains confidential in relation to what we discuss to really allow an open and fruitful and efficient negotiation today. So can we agree to that as well? Absolutely, and uh, given we only have 40 minutes today, 
um, many issues likely to discuss from both sides. Just wanted to uh, set a couple minutes aside at the end of the discussion, just to recap any agreements that we've reached thus far and uh, set up any next steps. Um, also, do you have full authority to, to uh, reach an agreement here today between Diaz and the university? Myself and Austin do have full authority. We really appreciate that suggestion of wrapping things up at the end. We think that's beneficial. That way we all understand what we end up agreeing to. And of course, we have full authority and we hope to reach an agreement here today. With that said, do you all have a pen handy? We do have a proposed agenda that we believe will help us get through all the talking points in a productive fashion. Yeah, absolutely. We, we are interested to hear kind of how your agenda is structured and what issues you're here to discuss today. Sure. So the first issue we want to discuss is salary and length. We want to, we want to speak about these issues together. That way we, meet, we in case there's any, any interconnective terms, we can make sure to address that. Second, we want to discuss performance incentives. And lastly, we want to discuss assistant coach salary. Okay, so how I understand that is deal with salary and length kind of in one unit, because you said there may be some areas that are in connected, uh, interconnected, performance-based bonuses and um, salary for assistant coaches or a budget for assistant coaches. Yes, that is correct. That, that is the agenda we have proposed today. Are there any, is there anything that you all would like to add? And if not, we, we think that this is a great agenda. Yeah, so kind of hearing that those are your three main issues today, um, what is DS's most important issue today? Well, we feel they're all pretty important, especially considering that the job with uh, Buckaroos is going to be a very tall order, considering they're coming off a very scandalous situation with Coach Williams and um, Dr. Robinson, we, our client is super excited to join the team, but she does understand that it's gonna be a challenge and she wants, she's gonna have to rebuild the, the culture essentially from the ground up, as well as convincing players to stay, as well as attracting new players. So we believe the way the order was laid out within our agenda will probably be the order of importance and make sure we get, I mean, at least get a, an outline of the discussion we can hope to agree to in the, in the near future. Thank you, Jonathan. I just wanted to touch, touch on one point you had mentioned that the recent scandal, um, as you referred to it at the university. So if I could ask, um, so what has attracted Coach Diaz? Um, what's made her willing to come to the university to, to work as a coach? Well, Daniel, we, we definitely appreciate that, that question, but just to slow down a little bit and backtrack really quickly, we just want to understand, are, are we all agreeing to this agenda that we have a set framework for this negotiation by, uh, by following what we laid out? And so um, I think we are definitely agreeing to start with the salary and the length. We can understand that they're interconnected, but as the negotiations go, other issues may be interconnected and we may have to deal with them as they come up. But yeah, we are able to discuss salary and length. And I think something important for us moving into that discussion is to understand what attracted Coach Diaz to Mustang University in the first place. That's understandable. We just wanted to clarify. We want to make sure the agenda was set before we move forward. The main reason that we think Coach Diaz would love to be with the school, with the University of Mustang, is the fact that she was the champion with that school in 2006. She's a great soccer player, loves the sport, has a great passion for it, and has had success at every level, including with the U.S. Women's National Team, where she won World Cups and Olympic medals. So we think that returning to the University of Mustang will be amazing for our client just because she can be such a great fit and a breath of fresh air following the recent incidents. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, thank you for explaining kind of some of the interest that lies um, behind Coach Diaz's um, interest to come to Mustang University. You had mentioned something previously about the scandal that had occurred. And obviously there were some challenges even given COVID um, and the changes in some of the soccer seasons that the university has faced. Um, if, um, if you could share a little bit about how uh, Coach Diaz views that scandal and how that affects her, her willingness to come to Mustang University and to stay here, whether she's looking for short-term options, long-term options. Sure, absolutely. And we, we thank you for that question. In, in terms of Coach Diaz and, and her really high interest in joining, joining the University of Mustang, we do understand the situation with Coach Williams and Dr. Robinson very, very much so. Our client's well aware of what happened previously, and she does believe that while currently the university may not, and the program may not be in the best light, she believes that she is the right person to put this program right back on track. As we said before, this is her dream job. This is her alma mater, and this is exactly where she envisions herself 
coaching soccer at a very high level and winning many championships, especially considering her coaching pedigree, her inner playing pedigree. And she thinks that she is the right person for this job to build back this, this program and really help the University of Mustang soccer team. We also want to hear from you all, what, what draws you all to coach DX? Because we've talked about her, her accomplishments. Are those really why you all are very interested in coach DS for the, for the program? Francis, thank you for sharing kind of um, a little bit more information about Coach Diaz's motivation, drive, and desire to come back to Mustang University. Um, you know, we understand and we respect the talent that she could potentially bring to the soccer team, um, and that is why she is one of the top candidates at Mustang University interviewing for this position, and I think why we're, we're here today to see if we can make something work. Um, so you had mentioned that she is interested in building the team back up um, and that she feels that she's the right person to do this. In terms of contract length, what is Coach Diaz potentially looking for? Does she feel like she can do this in a set amount of years? We were looking for a longer length, but we do want to turn that question back to you. We do understand that the school is transitioning in the athletic department in general, and we wanted to see if they were dedicate, looking to dedicate a more long-term length and how how what price point would be associated with that length. I mean, we do think that it's important to rebuild the culture and really set the best foot forward, considering that those type of issues that Mustang University has been recently dealing with are not the type of attention any school wants. Penn State could tell you that, Michigan State can tell you that, and we feel that restructuring the program itself with a very decorated woman in the lead would be the most important thing and the most beneficial to Mustang University as well. Thank you, Jonathan. And I just, um, I just wanted to share something with you that um, Coach Williams was actually overcompensated while he was at the university. Um, despite his successful record um, for actually he's been with the university for two decades, um, he did not oversee a profitable team. Um, so I just wanted to, to bring that out there in case that was one of the objective standards that, uh, that you may have been looking for, or your client may have been using in, uh, in considering compensation packages. We are in the process of restructuring some of those teams um, and how they work to potentially increase profitability um, and reduce any, any sort of losses year over year. Um, with that being said, to answer your question you asked previously about the length of time, uh, Mustang University is interested, of course, in keeping employees long-term. Uh, that being said, there are many both financial and um, practical limitations uh, that may apply. And so I believe uh, Mustang University would be most interested in a short-term sort of um, compensation package, which could potentially work to be renegotiated after that short term. We believe that that would serve the best interests of both clients, um, seeing as Coach Diaz would be able to have a proven track record at the university um, and, and really have more negotiating power when it comes time to renegotiate that contract. Then you, you mentioned a lot of very interesting things in what you just said, especially in relation to Coach Williams and how you all believe that he was being overcompensated and that he didn't foresee a profitable team. Just so we do have a couple of questions in relation to what you said. One of them being, does that mean that that would affect the amount of salary that you all are willing to offer Coach Diaz today? And also another question that we do have is you mentioned your interest in having a short-term contract for, for our client, Coach Diaz. We, we definitely do understand that interest on, on behalf of you all, but for us, and especially in relation to our client and where she envisions this team, she recognizes exactly where this program is currently. And we don't think it's proper to sugarcoat it. The program is not in the best situation, especially in the best light in terms of the public having or having players want to stay and retain talent. To our understanding, there are players looking to transfer, key players looking to transfer, and that can be detrimental to any program. So we believe a longer term contract, we're thinking 10 year contract for Coach DS would be very appropriate considering she is the right person to lead this program back from really the deaths that came from the Dr. Robinson scandal and also understanding what happened with Coach Williams as well. So having a long term contract, we really think addresses both needs because it allows the team to rebuild and Coach Diaz to implement her full system. But we also had that question about the overcompensation for Coach Williams as well, and if that affects salary. Yeah, Francis, I think I heard a couple of points raised and starting with um, the impact on salary. So, you know, the university recognizes that uh, Coach Williams was overcompensated and a lot of it was associated with kind of 
um, the long-term successes that Coach Williams had, con you know, contributed at the university. Um, so while he was overcompensated, the uh, soccer program as a whole is kind of restructuring their program and moving forward just to make sure that they are making more financial um, sound decisions, especially in light of COVID and in light of some of the other events that are surrounding the university. Um, I had heard you say that Coach Diaz is looking more for a, a 10 year commitment. Um, from that perspective, does Coach Diaz see her needing 10 years to you know, be able to achieve the same success that Coach Williams had done? that is something that's important to the university that they continue on that, you know, successful track record. And, you know, we, we don't actually have information that any of the you know key players are planning to leave. It's a very interesting that you mentioned that coach Williams is overpaid given the fact that before he came to the, to the Mustang program, the school had was a historic, had a historic losing record. They never made the tournament, never won any championships, but once Williams did come around, he turned everything around, he, including he got our, he coached our client who eventually did make it to the women's national team and became a winner multiple different times. So what we do understand it, we do think that it might be a, a might've be overplayed a bit just because he, we do think that he's someone that established a winning culture despite recent events. Uh, with that said, and to answer your question, our, our client is definitely looking to commit long-term to the program and build a sustainable culture that is not only inclusive of, of uh, new female players, but also a very high character. But in terms of your, uh, the other part of your question about winning record, it's hard to say. It's very hard to say because at the moment in time, it's gonna be hard to recruit new, new players. And as we understand it, there've been multiple players who have already transferred out of the school, including the, 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 the first student that started off in uh, Miss Jordan. So we do want to find a good deal, but we do think that a winning record is very important and a winning culture, both in terms of wins stacked up in the win column and cultural and teaching student athletes primarily good character, character traits and how to proceed in the world in a great fashion and great individuals. And actually touching on the culture aspect that my partner mentioned, we do also want to hear from the school. How do they plan to build on the culture and build back the culture of winning and build back a, a promising future and a promising culture that, that, that there was previously with Coach Williams, but obviously we understand what happened in the past few years and the recent scandal. So we want to know from the school's perspective, how do you all plan to rebuild a good culture for the soccer program? Thank you, Jonathan and Francis. There was a couple of questions. I'll try to um, loop back from the beginning there and, and try to address those. Um, so as you have started mentioning um, about the overcompensation, and I just wanted to touch a little bit about a little bit on that. So despite being as uh, having a very successful record with Coach Williams, so the, the school, the university does understand that it was a successful record. However, the teams were not profitable. And so that just comes down to the financial decision sometimes um, that feasibility in terms of whether or not it's sustainable for the university. Um, in terms of discussing and, and offering in terms of the length, um, prior to discussing that, I'll just address your point about um, what the university plans to do uh, moving forward. And I think the university's goal is, is quite simple, and that is to get the right coach for the right price um, in order to run their soccer programs moving forward. Um, with that being said, the university would be open to discussing an offer. Um, the base salary would be at $100,000 for Coach Diaz. And that is, um, there is room for additional uh, performance incentives should those, should those apply. And that would begin at a four year contract. So just so we hear your offer properly, Daniel, you're offering $100,000 over four years. So would that be $100,000 $100, paid each season or would that be split for $25,000 a year, just so we're very sure about this. I'm sorry, yeah, and maybe I missed $100,000 per year. That would be the, the salary Thank you. for the four-year contract term. As a follow-up question as well, you mentioned $100,000 a year. Is there a reason why you would pay, you choose to pay a, a very decorated female head coach, very proven, um, proven coach as well, a salary that's only a third of what Coach Williams was making with the school. We know we know he mentioned he was uh, overpaid according to how you feel about the situation, but we don't think a one third of that salary is appropriate, especially given that our client has and boasts winning records and Coach of the Year awards. 
And Jonathan, so let me touch on that. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, gender or uh, sex. That's not that has nothing to do with kind of the offer that's being presented to Coach Diaz. The university is interested in bringing the right coach for the right price, regardless of gender, regardless of sex. Um, and so while Coach Williams was overcompensated, so we do think that, you know, 300,000 plus number is quite, you know, over, you know, over the top. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with Coach Diaz's uh, gender or her sex. And, you know, Coach Williams, despite being overpaid, did have a 20 year track record at the university. Um, and we do understand that Coach Diaz would be going from a division two athletic school to a division um, one athletic school. And so there would be some, you know, maybe some time that she would need to adjust to the different level of athletics teaching there. Just to follow up on Austin's point, um, something I'd mentioned earlier about when we're discussing the, the terms of the contract, the length, um, it would be beneficial to both parties we see um, have a four year length. It would provide Diaz with an opportunity to build that track record at the school. Given every university has a different setup, has different teams, has different profitability. Um, the, um, the four years would really allow her to, to build that record and prove herself and then renegotiate um, to build that long-term relationship with the university. You mentioned a few times that you want to find the right coach at the right price. But as we understand in answering today's discussion, it's really down to two finalists, our client, client coach Diaz, and Montrose Ruff, the old assistant coach under the, under the Williams teams. Uh, we do think that, we do understand why the school, um, the university chose to part ways with, with, um, with coach Williams, given the fact that he was the, the figure, the headpiece of the soccer team there. Uh, however, but given the fact that Montrose Ruff was also part of that team for a very long period of time, we are considering, I mean, we're, we are thinking about whether he'd be the right person for the school, given the fact he has ties and connections to that, over, to that entire scandal. Yeah, Jonathan, and that is something that the university is aware of, and they look at a multitude of different factors. Um, but I do think that we're here today to discuss if Coach Diaz is the right fit. So I know Daniel had shared that um, the, the school is interested in potentially bringing Coach Diaz on for four years with a $100,000 base salary with the um, potential for some performance incentives. Is this something that Coach Diaz would be willing to work with to bring her talent and continue to develop her skills as a coach at um, the university? Yes, well, thank you. Thank you, Austin, for that. We, we do want to talk, let's talk about your offer of the $100,000 each year for four years. Now, with starting at $100,000 could be something we could discuss, but our client would definitely be looking for a substantial increase in salary pay over the contract term. And as we said before, we're looking for an eight-year it's right, excuse me, a 10-year contract for our client. Now, it seems to be that you all are not willing to agree to that 10-year contract at all, and you offer the four-year deal. So as, as we did say just a moment ago, we are willing to do an eight-year contract for our client, considering that this would meet the interests of both sides, that our client could have substantial time to really implement her culture and also have a long-lasting effect for the team. And we understand with a four-year deal, that could be re-upped after that year, but we don't think that would be necessary considering our client's track record and her just genuine accomplishments in soccer across the board. So we have confidence in our client that she would be able to restore the program. And by agreeing to the eight-year contract, we think really does meet the interests of both sides. Now, to go back to the other point, that $100,000 starting for the first year, we can talk about that. But we would have to build up from there to reach and to reach a more substantial salary amount for our client because only a hundred thousand dollars for the entire contract length is is just not something we can agree to. Just wanted to thank you, Francis, for sharing your perspective on term in terms of the length and coming down from the ten years to the potentially eight years you had mentioned. Um, so what what would that look like for Coach Diaz in terms of an eight year contract? Um, starting at the same offer price that we had mentioned and potentially um, increasing that offer price over time. We want them, uh, we want that the average of the eight year salary be $250,000 a year. Like Francis said, we are willing to start at a lower salary for the first year or two, but we do want the salary to be increasing over the years. And Jonathan, I just want to make sure that I understood that right. So, you know, if we were to move forward with an eight-year contract term starting at that $100,000, it sounded like you said that you wanted the average to equal $250,000. $250, That's correct. Okay. 
So do you have any particular structures in mind that uh, Coach Diaz would um, would uh, would be satisfied with financially in terms of her own needs? Um, looking at that, you mentioned the $250,000 average um, would be quite a jump from the $100,000 after four years um, to increase a salary like that. So what, what would that look like if you could just lay, lay out the per year terms? Yeah, we, we definitely understand that. But we also want, I guess, a bit more clarification on your side as well as to we, we do make this offer of $250,000 average for the eight years. Is that something that's workable for you all in relation to that average amount of salary being able to be paid for Coach Diaz? I think we need to understand a little bit more kind of what that structure would look like. So what from one year to two year to three and so forth is Coach Diaz really needs so she feels that she can, you know, come to the university and do what she um, plans to. The main reason is our, our client knows she's a very decorated and uh, a, a coach has a winning record across different leagues, whether as a player or as a coach. So we want, she wants to make sure that we are able to, to secure her a salary that she is worth. And we understand that right at the moment in time, you can offer the highest salary for the first couple of years. But we feel that an average salary is a good framework to discuss the rest of the discussion. And of course, it could, we could be determined later on what each year, how much each salary would be broken down by year. But we think for the, term, for the sake of this discussion, we're looking to secure a certain average and we could base our negotiation and conversation going forward based off of that. And just to be clear that eight years is the minimum our client is willing to go in terms of length. She wants to dedicate herself to this program and we just wanna be very, very transparent with that and let you all know that information moving forward. And I appreciate that transparency, Jonathan. Um, so I'll, I'll share with you that the uh, eight years is definitely something that the university is open to. As I had mentioned, they preferred a shorter term um, just in terms of structuring and planning the new soccer um, layout at, in their athletics departments. However, the university is willing to entertain the eight-year offer. Um, with that being said, you had mentioned a $250,000 average. Is that, a, is that a bottom line, the minimum that uh, Coach Diaz would be willing to accept to sign with the university? Well, can we understand as to why you all would not be able to pay $250,000 in terms of an average salary? Because we really do understand that the school has been going through a lot recently. And we also understand your position that Coach Williams was overpaid, but we really think Coach Diaz is the right person for this job. And you keep mentioning the right price for the right coach. We believe this is the right price and we believe Coach Diaz is the right coach. So could you please tell us why you wouldn't be able to pay $250,000 on average to our client? Francis. So we are just kind of still in the process of talking about numbers, talking about structure and, and what that would look like. So we're just trying to get an understanding of what Coach Diaz is looking for and maybe how we can provide that for her and just kind of what that would look like overall. And I think you actually kind of hit on it. The university has been going through a lot of things and that does impact their, um, their financial situation. And that is something that we do have to take into consideration here today. So just so we're clear, we, we still haven't heard a, a firm answer from you all. Is $250,000 something you all could agree to for an average salary over eight years? We, we don't seem to have any affirmative answer on that yet. So um, continuing on the previous um, conversation in terms of the extension of the term. So when, with the university coming, and I'll, and I'll get back to the amount right away. I'm not trying to like, go to the term and then avoid the amount, but I just wanted to show that they're all interconnected. And with the universities planning to do this compensation, package and structure, there are a lot of moving pieces that are required to ensure that not only the financial success of the university, but the financial sustainability. We want to make sure that the university moving forward, should the soccer department not be profitable, is still able to sustain these salaries and these compensations. So with that being said, in, in converting to a, or an agreeing to extend to an eight-year contract, um, there is something that the university would be interested in having. Um, which based on our conversation seems like might be, of, might be acceptable to your client, and that would be a liquidated damages clause should your client leave to pursue another coaching career. We really appreciate that information. And just to provide some information to you all, if our client makes this commitment, she's making this commitment. She wants to be here. We've said throughout, this is her dream job. She wants to be here. She wants to help girls develop in soccer and eventually get up to the highest level. And we do, we would be, in, we would be, amenable to including liquidated damages within our contract. But with that said, we do see notice that time is starting to run a bit low. So we wanna propose a mutual three minute break at this point in time. So if we come back in and see if we can lay out the foundation for the rest of the discussion. 
Is that something you'd be amenable to? Sure. Absolutely, Jonathan. So we'll take a three minute break. And then I did just want to, before we pop out, note what time we still have left in our meeting scheduled for today. Yeah, we have about my clock, th about 13 and a half minutes. Did you say 13 and a half? About, yes. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. So yes, again, hello, Daniel Austin. Thank you for taking that break with us. We did take into account everything that we have been discussing and do have a global offer to present to you all right now. So in terms of the contract length and the salary, we appreciate you all being willing to agree to that eight year to the eight year contract length in relation to the salary amount. We're still going to offer the $250,000 average for eight years since we have yet to hear another offer from you all and also any reason if you all could agree to it or not. So we're gonna still offer the $250,000. And then in relation to the performance-based incentives, we would, our client was really looking for $150,000 in performance-based performance -based incentives. And in relation to the third talking point of assistant coach salary, we're looking to maintain the current assistant coach salary budget of $250,000. And you all did bring up the liquidated damages provision earlier, and we definitely understand your, your interest in, in regards to that. And so we are willing to agree to a liquidated damages clause that would be 25% of the salary from years five through eight. So that would be the amount of, the, that would be the percentage of liquidated damages that we will be willing to pay. Thank you. And if I'm understanding correctly, I just want to clarify one portion. So in your offer, you had mentioned $250,000 average salary. So that would assume um, we don't have a firm calculation yet because we would have some kind of increase in salaries. Am I correct for the liquidated damages clause? As we wouldn't be going off of the average, we'd be going off of the actual salary for years five to eight. Yes. And that'd be 25% of the salary for years five to eight. Of that salary, okay. And we've we've talked likewise, um, and considered the interests and um, the benefits of having uh, Coach Diaz join the the university. We do appreciate her long term commitment to the university as well, um, even though it it is something that is a little bit of a a stretch for the university in terms of their original plan. Um, I will present a counter offer to you, um, and we can kind of work on structuring some of the little details together. Um, as I had mentioned, the length. We'll stick with the eight year length. Um, you had mentioned that Coach Diaz is um, committed to the university. Once she joins, she really wants to stay and build up the university. And so we, will, um, we would ask for a $500,000 liquidated damages clause. And this is only in the event that she would leave to take another coaching job. Um, and from what you had talked about today, it doesn't really sound like um, Coach Diaz is interested in leaving the university once she's brought on. Um, so, you know, we don't necessarily see a concern with the liquidated damage clause being at $500,000. Daniel, I apologize, you were still explaining the offer. Yep, no problem. So I just wanted to, um, to offer a $200,000 average for the entire duration of the eight-year contract. And originally we had offered $100,000 a year for the first four years, so that would remain. And if my calculations are correct, that would leave a $300,000 salary for years five to eight. Now, given that there is an increased salary, a dramatically increased salary in years five to eight, the university would request a, a buyout clause um, for the back end of that contract. And that would be for the last four years. So that's for the increased portion of the contract, um, years five through eight. And should there be a termination um, for, um, for best interest of the university, there would be a 50% buyout clause applied to those, um, to those salaries. So just to clarify, you want a buyout clause and liquidated damages? So the buyout clause is that the liquidated damages is only in the, in the event that the coach would leave to another coaching position. So the two wouldn't apply simultaneously. Um, the buyout clause is more of if she if she's terminated for the best interests of the university, given that it is a big financial commitment in those last four years. Are in relation to the buyout clause, that's not something we'd be able to agree to. We are willing to discuss the liquidated discussion, the liquidated damages discussion a bit further. However, we are a bit concerned about that $500,000 offer you mentioned earlier. As you both know, liquidated damages must be reasonable in relation to the damage that would be incurred if there were to be a breach. We think that $500,000 amount is unreasonable, quite frankly. We do think that liquidated damage would be proper to, to work within our overall structure, but we can't, we don't think that 
working around a set that big of a set figure of half a million dollars would it be appropriate. But what we can do in light of your collaboration this, uh, at this time, we're willing to move up our previous offer for liquidated damages from 25% of years five through eight to 35% of years five through eight. And Jonathan, I do just want to point out, so it sounded like that you said that you're, you're not authorized to enter into um, a buyout clause. In relation to the buyout clause, it's just very difficult for us to agree to that, especially since our client is very interested in being a part of the school and is very committed to being a part of it. And to hear the term buyout clause within a contract, which basically gives the power to the university, that's a bit difficult for us to hear, especially since our client is very dedicated to the school, especially as we did express interest in signing the liquidated damages provision. So we would definitely like to see that there, no buy, there be no buyout clause within the overall agreement. Now, in terms of that liquidated damages offer, is that something you all could agree to? Well, Francis, before we get to that, just as you had shared that your client is unwilling to accept anything um, less than eight years, our client can't engage in a contract that's more, that that's at the eight year mark without having a buyout clause in place. So that is something that we do need to discuss today. And if I could just touch on one point as well, you mentioned the liquidated damages at 500,000 is a significant sum. Um, so if I could just clarify the salary that Coach Diaz would be earning in our last offer was $300,000 per year in years five through eight. That would put the total of those four years at $1.2 million. So the 500,000 would be in relation to that 1.2 million. Um, you had countered at 35% for the amount for a liquidated damages clause. And if I'm correct, that would, that would amount to around $420,000 for that liquidated damages clause. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, but in that situation, it would be ranging the years five through eight and it'd be broken up and it wouldn't be a one-time half a million dollar fee, which is significantly different. With that in mind, is that 35% uh, liquidated damage percentage for years five through eight something you can accept? So help me just understand how it would be broken down. So if she were to leave um, at the seven year mark, let's say, or at the eight year mark and pursue another coaching position, how would that uh, liquidated damages clause be broken up in your counter offer? In relation to the way that would work for us is that for years five through eight, the amount of money that would be allocated towards our client, 35% of that money would be would go towards the liquidated damages provision. So, so that's how that, that amount would come to. And we do would appreciate an answer in terms of if you all would be able to agree for a liquidated damages clause. So we, we would require, the university would require a $500,000 um, uh, liquidated damages clause. I'm sorry, we're talking about the clauses so much, I'm forgetting what it's called now. The liquidated damages clause, so that would be required by the university. I see that we only have about uh, two minutes left here in our discussion. Um, Austin, did you want to wrap up and kind of uh, talk about some of the terms that we've discussed and maybe set up some plans for a further discussion? Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like um, what we have been discussing is an eight-year term and we have shared that in order to do an eight-year term, uh, a buyout clause would need to be included. So we do ask that you, you know, go and take that back to your client as well, because it sounds like you may not be authorized. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but for that eight-year term, it would be a $200,000 average. We're still working out potentially how that could be structured, but we have been discussing in years five through eight, um, $300,000. And um, we are discussing currently right now uh, a liquidated damages clause around the $500,000 mark rather than the 35%. And with that, I'll just add that we are also open to further discussion on performance incentives, as well as the assistant coach salaries, which you had mentioned earlier. That is something that is still on the table and uh, potentially agreeable by the university. Something we do hope to secure before this conversation is said and done, it doesn't seem that we're too far apart in terms of salary. Your last offer for salary was $200,000 average, our last offer was $250,000 average. We feel we can meet in the middle here and agree to $225,000 as an average for the salary. We feel that would meet both of our interests and serve as a good way to end this conversation and pick up next time we discuss. So I appreciate uh, you wanting to wrap things up and um, keeping in mind the, what Austin had mentioned about the um, both liquidated damages clauses as well as the uh, buyout clauses. If that is something that we can still discuss after you've brought it to your client, then the $225,000 average is something the university is willing to work with. Absolutely. 
that's that's awesome to hear. So so it seems that we are tentatively agreeing to that two hundred and twenty five thousand dollar amount. To what we understand is that the buyout clause and the liquidated damages of five hundred thousand dollars, those seem to be requirements on behalf of the school. And if that is the way if that is the way that we understand that properly, and that Fine. is the case, then we appreciate that information, and we'll send a memo over to you. Thank you, Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Judges, thank you for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Again, my name is Austin Booth. My name is Daniel Shikan, and we just represented Mustang University on team four in a negotiation with Francis and Jonathan, who represented Coach Diaz. We will, the we will answer the two following questions for you today. First, if we were to do this negotiation again in the future, what we would do the same and what we would do differently. What we would do the same is we would continue to ask questions to understand what is truly important to Coach Diaz. Throughout the negotiation today, we asked questions to understand why she wanted to come to Mustang University and what she thought she was capable of if she was capable of achieving once she came there. We did receive assurances through the other, from the other side throughout the negotiation um, that showed that Coach Diaz would be committed to making a commitment to the team and put in the energy and effort needed to continue the long-term success of the soccer program which the university was interested in having continue. We would also recap throughout the negotiation. So as you saw, there are a lot of moving pieces related to this contract negotiation. Base salary bonuses, liquidated damage clauses, um, in addition to a variety of other topics we didn't get to fully explain. Um, but we would continue to recap throughout the process so that we can be sure that everybody is on the same page. And before any offers are countered or um, accepted that we understand what piece is actually fitting into what area of the contract that we're looking at. And lastly, we wouldn't rush into any offers for the sake of rushing in. So at the end, there was an offer that was presented on the table, I believe, of $225,000 average salary. Um, and while we would have loved to leave the negotiation today with a comprehensive agreement, um, we do need to fully understand all of the pieces, and many of them are interconnected. Um, we're not willing to rush into an offer uh, because we want to keep our clients' interests at the forefront of every decision that we make. And now I'll share a few things that we would do differently if we were to do this negotiation again. And first, we would have liked to explore more creative options and perhaps set up more clear frameworks for all of the additional contract terms that were being discussed. For example, looking at both liquidated damages clauses and buyout clauses. Although we did not attempt um, to make it clear to the other side that this was a requirement given a longer term contract. So we did attempt to make this clear. It seems that there still was some uncertainty surrounding um, what was negotiable and what was not with the university. We would have liked to explore these options in more depth at an earlier stage, perhaps, to not have any doubts as to what was required by either party in order to reach and build an agreement here today. And second, something else we would do differently is we would better manage our time to ensure that we allocate more time to all subject areas as needed. So for example, we did spend a lot of time learning about Coach Diaz's desires uh, to coach for the university. And as this was crucial to our understanding in order to negotiate favorable terms for both parties, it did not leave us much time to discuss some of the remaining contract terms, um, as well as additional items such as performance bonuses and assistant coach salaries. We welcome any questions from the judges at this time. Well, it doesn't appear that there are any questions um, from the judges, but if there are, please chime in. But if not, thank you again for your time. We truly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Are the judges ready to hear our post-negotiation analysis? Yes, go ahead. Wonderful. Just as a reminder, my name is Francis. And my name is Jonathan. And today we represented JC Diaz. To summarize a 40 minute negotiation in just five minutes, that was very interesting to say the very least. Once we laid out an agenda, we started discussions on the contract length and the salary and received really helpful information in the beginning about how they would want a shorter term contract and express how they thought Coach Williams was overpaid. Initially, they were very transparent with their side's positions and we did agree to an eight year deal. But when we started discussing salary, we clearly stated how we couldn't agree to $100,000 and offered a $250,000 average salary. 
we ask them multiple times to give us a response if they're able to agree to that number, yet they kept deflecting and they kept mentioning other aspects of the agreement. They even mentioned a liquidated damages clause. They, they seem to just be really evading our salary amount, even after multiple times where we tried to really get an answer from them. Although this did happen, and this is unfortunate because we weren't able to reach a full agreement, we did agree to that $225,000 amount, which we think is at least very beneficial for our client, and we laid out a perfect framework to discuss everything else in the future and come to an agreement then. We do understand there are two questions we are to address when reflecting on today's negotiation. If given this opportunity again tomorrow, what are some things we do the same, and what are some things we would do differently? Something we'd absolutely do the same in this negotiation is make that last minute offer in regards to average salary. When we returned, when we returned from our break and we presented our global offer incorporating talking points we had yet to discuss in order to the groundwork for the rest of the discussion, the negotiation clock continued to tick and we realized that we would not have sufficient time left in the negotiation to decree all of the terms, specifically the buyout clause and liquidated damage provision since we were so far apart but we did notice we were very close in terms of average salary. We remain, we remain firm of our offer of 250,000 and they returned from their break with an offer of $200,000 in an average over eight years. We ended up resorting to the classic split the baby technique in the last second and offered to split the difference with our opponents and agreed to a $225,000 average over eight years. We consider this a huge win, especially considering we only came down $25,000 from our initial requests and they came up about $125,000 from their original offer. So that is something we would definitely implement again in the future is attempt to narrow the difference on some issues, even if we are a bit further apart on others. And to answer the second part of that question, something we would do differently in a future negotiation is take our tactical use of a three minute break a bit earlier on in the negotiation. Now we do ask the other team to take a mutual break in hopes to really understand that once we do take this break and they take theirs as well, that they are not able to take another break additionally and to really make a more effective and efficient use of time given we only have 40 minutes for the negotiation. Now in today's negotiation, we asked them to take that three minute break at around the 17 minute mark when we were really trying to discuss the overall amount of salary and they just kept really avoiding our questions. If we took that break a little bit earlier, maybe we could have avoided those issues with them just not answering our questions about salary and reach the full agreement in the future. We'd like to pause now. Do the judges have any questions for us? Uh, yes, uh, this is Judge Jakubik. Um, what was the uh, theory behind taking a break at all? Well, we realized that we've only discussed salary and length up at that point only a third of our overall, overall negotiation agenda. So we felt by taking our break, we come back in and make a global offer, incorporating issues we had yet to discuss, such as the performance-based incentives and potentially even the liquidated damage provision that our opponents brought up before we took the break. We felt by taking our break, we, we would be able to make our global offer and lay the roadmap and be able to pick up at this point of the conversation if we do have a follow-up negotiation. We do see we have a little bit of time left, so we did want to speak about something else we would do the same. We would use a tactic we like to call psychological word choice, which is a cognitive selection of certain words or phrases to subtly influence our opponents or to shape the tone and atmosphere of the conversation. We feel we would have used the, the terms we instead of I as we did today to convey that we are united front and cannot be split up. At times when questions were directed at one of us, we made sure the other teammate answered the question because we knew what our limits were and we knew what we could agree to, but we also wanted to convey that we were united and we would not agree to anything that would compromise our client's position. We see that our time is up. Thank you so much for, for judging today's competition and we look forward to your feedback. Thank you. You want me to start? This is, this is Judge Galbraith. Um, I kind of took my notes by team. So I'm gonna go over team four if that's okay first and um, hit the high points and then do team 10. Um, Daniel and Austin, I uh, thought you did an excellent job. Um, after you warmed up, I thought the introduction was um, not as smooth as it could be. The pre-negotiation stage, it was, it was, it was to me, 
you know, that's kind of part of the area that you could prepare. And it, you guys did a really good job once you were standing on your own feet, coming up with arguments and summarizing. Um, excellent, very good on your feet, um, both of you. So, Daniel, I liked, um, it's a very practical point I wanted to give you. Um, I liked how you came in to, and tried to confirm that there is authority on the table, that you have authority to proceed. And because I, that happens in real life a lot, and um, that's important to get uh, a commitment out of the other side that yes, they're there with authority or they have the person with authority on the phone immediately. So you can make um, decisions and enter into actual agreements. So Austin, I liked um, your job. You did summarizing um, after they said their arguments, you did a really good job showing like flexibility and ability to repeat their arguments and organize your thoughts very well. So I like that. Um, I thought, Austin, I also thought you were very um, influential when you were talking about the importance of Diaz and um, the 10 year for her to stay, I think you did a really good job showing a lot of credibility. And um, Daniel, I think you do a really nice job using hand gestures just at the right time. I have a tendency, I know that I've been out of law school 30 years and sometimes I can overuse my hands. And I think, you know, I'm not saying you overused Austin by any means, I just say, I just really noticed Daniel had a nice affect in, in using that, so. That's always very um, influential and persuasive when you can use hand gestures right. So um, I liked Austin to your ability to come over the gender bias question. You did a really good job, you know, taking the focus off the hot topic and putting it, you know, back on the relevant issue, what you felt. So I like that. Good job. Um, team 10, Francis and John, um, you guys uh, really come across to me as, a, you know, very influential type people. Um, I like, you both seem like very natural and easy to get along with, which I like, you know what I mean? It's like, I'd want to be your friends and I'd like to be Austin and Daniel's friends too, but I'm just saying, just from your natural, um, you know, your humanistic behavior. I liked it. It was very natural, incredible. Um, I liked your pre-negotiation analysis, both of you. Um, I thought it was really influential and well-organized. Um, I like how you kind of said four points, one, two, three, four, and it makes it really easy to um, understand and take it in, so. Um, Francis, I was going to point out that I really liked, again, is another point of, that it's very, um, what you, you mentioned on confidentiality and, you know, that it's a settlement negotiation. I love that. Um, that's something that we do frequently when we're negotiating and we're putting things on the table like that. So that's a very practical thing to do and something that's very important are confidentiality clauses too. So um, I liked the way Francis, you did a good job redirecting, um, redirecting the framework when you disagreed with certain things. I liked that. It was, it was influential. Um, Jonathan, I thought you had good redirection too on issues. And um, I always say be careful to playing, you know, race cards or gender cards like that. Um, but you had to have, you know, thought about that at least for 24 hours, but just always be careful on something like that. Um, Jonathan, uh, I loved your uh, end point on the post analysis for the reason for the break. I thought that was extremely well said and a good 
it was kind of the answer to the question I thought was good. So thank you. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Cynthia Brisbane. And just to give you guys a little background on me, I am currently an administrative law judge with the state of Illinois. Before that, I was a public defender for nine years. And also I work for DCFS. So um, a lot of litigation experience and which is why I enjoy doing this competition to hear you know, how the students are doing and to hopefully give you some insight that will help you in your negotiations in the future and, and or litigation, which is really closely tied together. So um, first I'll say both teams, you did a really good job. I mean, I know that you all received these um, problems. You don't have a lot of time to prepare, um, but you guys really had an excellent grasp on uh, what your clients wanted. And um, I think you both did really, really well. Um, I'll start with team 10, uh, Francis and Jonathan. Um, first of all, as an aside, I really think that you guys had great energy. Uh, both of you are like really ready to go. And I think that's important. You wanna bring energy to the table. You don't wanna be you know, flat or appear disinterested in what you're there to do. So I think that's really good. Um, and I think that you use that well, even in the, um, the pre-planning, you immediately sought to engage with, with us and and then you went right into your strategy. So I, th I think that's really good because in the negotiation, you want to uh, show the other side, like, hey, you know, we're <clears throat> we're human beings, you know, we're here to help our clients. And I think that can work well for you. So um, very good with that. Um, I think that you guys have really good control of the nego negotiation from the beginning. Um, you immediately set out the fact that you all had an agenda that you wanted the other side to follow. And, and they did, so you were, um, you were very smart to do that because if you're controlling the agenda, you're controlling the negotiation. And so if you wanna be in that position, you, you, if you can be in that position, you want to. Um, I like how you control the flow of the numbers. Um, I believe you were the first one to say a number uh, uh, and, and, and that's important. And I think that I think that you recognize that if you didn't say a number, the other side was never gonna say a number. And so you say, okay, well, let's say a number and you know, get the ball rolling. So I think that that was um, really smart to jump in and try to get that ball rolling. Um, uh, Francis, and particularly with you, I thought it was really good that you uh, were firm with the $250,000. And until they gave you a reason to come down, you were gonna come down. And they never gave you a reason to come down. So you, you never came down. So I, I think that was really important for you to stick with that. Because if you had come down and they hadn't given you anything, then you've given up a, a lot of leverage before you even needed to. So I think you did a good job there. Uh, Jonathan, I think you took a break at a really good time. Um, nothing was happening on the other side. <laughs> and you notice, you know, uh, we're running out of time here. They're not giving us anything. So, and so I thought that was a really good indication of um, paying attention to what's happening in the negotiation and working with your teammate. It's okay, well, they're not giving us anything, so maybe we should talk to each other. So I think, you know, sometimes you need to make a decision to do that, and I think you did that at a good time. Um, the, only, the only negative I have, or something that you really want to be careful about, which uh, Judge Gilbert mentioned before, um, you need to be careful with um, if you want to imply something. So um, they, when they offered the hundred thousand dollars, and you immediately said, "You immediately said, well, why only a third? Why are you only offering us a third? Well, that was their first offer. So I think it would have probably been a little more productive if you had actually uh, counter offered the hundred. Don't don't question why they only offered you that. Counter the offer with and give a justification for why you thought their first offer was way too low or whatever it was. So I think it would have been more constructive for you to do that instead of imply accusations that only sidelines the negotiation and you're not gonna get where you wanna get to with your client. So um, other than that, you guys did a great job. 
Um, so for team four, Austin and Daniel, um, also a good job. I thought your strategy was really good, um, very laid out, and um, it was a bit robotic. Um, so you, you want to try to use any opportunity you can to engage with whoever you're talking to. So um, if you're laying out your strategy and you're, you're not really saying why you think it will work or you know what you're gonna try, then it, it gets kind of lost in the weeds. So I would say that um, you had a great strategy, but find a better way to relay that to your audience. Um, other, otherwise, you guys had uh, really good responses to the, they kept bringing up the scandal. They kept bringing up the scandal, which uh, that was good for them to do. But I thought that you guys did a good job of trying not to talk about the scandal. You wanted to talk more about the actual coach and why she wanted to come to your school. So I thought that was really good to try to turn the tables on that and make it about, you know, well, why should we hire her? You know, even though you're in a position that is not the best, you you still try to come from a position of strength as to why, you know, she wants to come here versus why we should hire her. So I thought that was good that you did that. Um, I think the only thing I have to say negative about you guys aside is that uh, Austin, you did a, a great job when you said, uh, we listen, we can't have a contract without a buyout. And I thought that was great. But then Daniel, you stepped all over it. So before the other side had a chance to come back and possibly find common ground for that issue, uh, Daniel, you, you start talking about something else. I think, I, I can't remember what it was, but it was a very long thing that you start talking about. And the question never got back around to what your partner had just laid out there. So I think it's really important to work better together and to listen to give you know, your teammate the chance to maybe get you guys a little further in the negotiation. So I think that was a lost opportunity to find common ground on um, the buyout clause because she said we have to have one. So, um, but other than that, I think that both teams did really, really well and good luck. Thank you. All right, this is uh, Jared Jakubik. Uh, I guess you all can hear me, right? All right. Uh, just as a background, I, I was with Baker and McKenzie uh, for um, like 40 some odd years. So I've done a lot of negotiation uh, and you, you all did a very good job as, as prior people have commented. I, I think all of, all of the people at this stage are, are very excellent in what they're doing and particularly your cooperation within your groups was, was great. Uh, starting with uh, team four, uh, Austin and David, um, I think you, you did right, uh, you did well in the organization of uh, how you were going to proceed uh, and, and then proceeding. Uh, I think you, you handled the feedback very well. And uh, I, I think you, you, particularly on the buyout issue, I think you, you handled that as well as you're gonna handle it. I don't think you anticipated getting the pushback you did. Uh, but you got it and you, you handled it and, and you, you certainly knew it was important for your client. Uh, on the, on the, the only thing that I somewhat question is your emphasis on the liquidated damages as early as you did it in the, in the, uh, uh, the negotiations. Um, I mean, this is something that kicks in if she, if she leaves uh, and takes another job. And, you know, obviously it's important, but probably in the scheme of things, some of the other issues like the buyouts for, you know, when you want to terminate, when, when you want to get rid of her, uh, is probably more significant to probably emphasize. And you did emphasize it. I just, I just thought that the, the, you got into the weeds on the liquidated damages perhaps a little too soon. Uh, but uh, again, I, you know, you're, you're, you did handle it very well. Uh, for Team Ten, uh, I, I, I again, I, I think your your pre uh, analysis was okay, although it was a little structured. In other words, you you were doing a lot of hornbook stuff, you know, like we got to do this, we got to do that. And that was fine, but I think you were sort of speaking to the judges in terms of each other, and maybe that's what you're supposed to do. But in any event, I 
I thought it was a little, little too predictable. On the other hand, your emphasis on an agenda, uh, as one of the other judges mentioned, is important. And even though you only had the three item agenda, I think it is important to organize how you're gonna proceed. And certainly the salary and the length of the contract were the most important things for your client. And um, as well as obviously you never guys never did get around to the performance bonuses. But um, you know, those are the things that obviously are important to somebody who's gonna enter into a contract. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the uh, other thing, I guess the, uh, the uh, going to a bonus, I guess you, you, sh you did mention a bonus, but I think that was really not, not emphasized much at all. Uh, but otherwise it was, you know, it, it went along pretty well. So I guess those are my comments. I, I, I think uh, both teams did fine. And, uh, you know, you, you're, you're a credit to, uh, you're credit to the American Bar Association. Thank you. Uh, just a few very brief comments. I'm astounded at how well both teams did, given the short time that you had to prepare for this particular round. Uh, both teams, I think, laid out a very good strategy for approaching the case. Uh, I, I would, in general, criticize, criticize one thing that I think both teams uh, erred in relationship with. If something is actually an irreducible minimum for the negotiation from your side, I think you got to bring that up fairly quickly in terms of the negotiations. Otherwise, you're wasting a lot of time. And, and there was, in particular, if I understand correctly, uh, a minimum of eight years. Uh, it took too long to get to that. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, it's quite clear why both of these, both groups here are here uh, as a practical matter. Uh, you both have an incredible uh, future in the law an incredible future in negotiating complicated deals. I almost think this problem is too complicated to deal with in a 40 minute period of time. Uh, but that's, a, that's, that's my own belief. And uh, I'm not supposed to criticize the drafters of the problem. So I will withdraw that <laughs> comment. For what it's worth. Anyway, good luck for the future for, to all of you. Uh, and uh, uh, next time you negotiate uh, in a serious matter, I hope you get well paid for it. <laughs> Maybe not hundred thousand dollars negotiation, but uh, what the heck? <laughs> thank you. We want to thank all the judges. We really appreciate the feedback, and we'll try our best to incorporate that going forward. And also, want to thank Daniel and Austin. You guys are great. That was a great round, and we're really glad we were able to participate in this final round with you both. Likewise, thank you very much to the judges and to the uh, opponents. Thank you, everybody. Um, again, I'm Wendy Adele Humphrey. I have served as the chair of the ABA National Negotiation Competition during the 2020-2021 academic year, um, along with our other committee members, uh, Kelly Feely, her name is somewhere, there she is, OJ hey. Salinas, <laughs> and Rick Bells, and Hi. then also uh, the uh, ABA Law Student Division, um, that staff, and as we call them, family. Um, we have Erica Zepeda here, you can see her, and of course, Sarah Stretch. So thank you to the American Bar Association and the Law Student Division for continuing this wonderful competition every year. Before we make the announcement of the second place team and our national champions, I would love to give our judges an opportunity to introduce themselves just very briefly. Um, your name and, and where you practice, the type of law that you practice, um, so that everyone here is aware of that. Um, in person, we usually do that, so I thought I'd give you the opportunity here. Um, let's see. And anyone can start. Judge Galbraith? Um, I'm Jill Galbraith. I am in Lexington, Kentucky, and I currently serve as senior in-house counsel to Valvoline Franz and um, in the attorney, there's about 15 of us that does the contracts. So I do the sponsorship contracts with NASCAR. I do contracts oh, cool. for marketing. I do contracts for procurement. I do contracts for the sales department and 
for North America and Latin America. So I do a lot of contracts and a lot of negotiating. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of people on my team, but I jump in a lot of times just at the, the last step or two to make those final arguments and get those final points that are so important to us. So thank you. Very interesting. Well, thank you. Um, our other judges, go ahead and, and dive in and introduce yourselves. I'm Professor Alan Schoenberger. Uh, I teach at a law school. And I was just remembering that I was actually a, a coach for this competition, yeah. for law school's first comp com competition. It may have been the first year. I don't know if it was the first year, but it was a long time ago, more, well more than 40 years ago, if I recall correctly. Uh, so uh, I had a, a, a decent amount of connection, but I don't teach uh, negotiation. Uh, I, I teach constitutional law, administrative law, and, and various other international law related subjects uh, as a practical matter. But uh, I, I find this a very enjoyable competition. Well, thank you for staying involved for all these years in one way or another. We appreciate it. And we have two more judges. Uh, Jerry Jakubik. Um, I was with uh, Baker McKenzie for probably more than 40 years. And then um, I retired. Of course, my dog just decided to bark. Now. <laughs> but uh, um, I was in primarily uh, banking, structured finance, and international finance uh, based in Chicago with um, Baker McKenzie's international, so we everybody does a lot of that. Uh, but I did a lot of negotiation, so that was it was very interesting. Thank you Thank for inviting you. me. And where's our fourth judge? There you are. Oh, I am here. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, yeah. I, I I sort of introduced myself earlier, so I, um, just briefly, okay. um, just a career litigation. And very happy to be a part of the competition again this year. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, so as you can see, we have um, some really just for this round that bring that brought some um, diverse perspectives to the competition. So again, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to judge this final round. Um, we, we really do appreciate it. Okay, as a, a reminder. Um, the national champions, um, in addition to a 20%, uh, a coupon for 20% off a study aid item, you're also going to get three free months of Quimby gold. Now I'm not, I mean, I'm also a professor, <laughs> but I don't know what that resource is, but it sounds like it's a pretty good one. So just as a reminder, you do win something tangible as well. Okay. Um, and then finally, before announcing, I also, we have some coaches on here. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you to the coaches. You go above and beyond with the time that you dedicate to these teams. And we all thank you for your contributions to this competition. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to first announce the second place team. Now remember, we started with 168 teams representing 82 different law schools. So second place in the nation is an amazing accomplishment and we congratulate you. So second place team is team number four from Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. Those team members are Austin Booth and Daniel Sheikham. Congratulations, gentlemen. So that leaves as our ABA National Negotiation Championship team for this year, team number 10, California Western School of Law, team members, Francis Carlotta and Jonathan Gonzalez. Raise your hands, gentlemen, where are you? Like, there you are, yay. Congratulations. Excellent job. 